All right, the recording has started. I've confirmed that the mic is working. We can begin. Uh, <clears throat> everyone should have the first packet. This is the first handout. It's eight pages. Is there anyone who does not have a packet? No? Okay. <clears throat> Next week is spring break. And the week after that is our second exam. So today we're going to go over what that second exam is going to look like, <clears throat> do a practice exam, and then we're going to jump straight into a problem solving session on Tuesday's topic. Your next exam, module exam two, is Tuesday, March 19th. It's the Tuesday we come back from spring break, so two weeks from now. Uh, <clears throat> the logistically, the two exams are identical. You'll have an announcement that goes out this evening that, that says come by uh, 15 minutes early. If you miss the exam, that's a zero, et cetera, et cetera. All that stuff. Content-wise, though, this, this exam is a bit shorter. It only covers reactions and the mole. Uh, of course, we spent a lot of time on reactions alone. I think uh, today's lab, uh, you're going to see the extent of what some questions can look like. Uh, so although it, it, is a very it is a very dense topic, reactions will be very simple on the, on the exam in terms of what to expect. Uh, today's practice exam will give you an idea of what that looks like. Under reactions, you are expected to know to incorporate state symbols. You need to know how to correctly balance an equation and predict products. You are not allowed any handout from the class except for the blank periodic table. Anything else that you may need, uh, I will put on the exam. If I don't give it to you, of course, you were expected to memorize it. Of course, you also need to know how to generate not net ionic equations. You're still struggling with that. Today's lab is a good practice. And finally, redox reactions. <clears throat> okay. Next up, we, of course, uh, the mole will also be on the exam. That first bullet point kind of captures all of the math. You should be able to interconvert between the mole, the mass, and the number of atoms or molecules, the Avogadro's number. And of course, we're going to get some practice on that today. And then finally, on the mole, you need to be able to calculate the empirical formula and the molecular formula. That's that table. Uh, that goes through percentages. Finally, this time your extra credit is, wait, is working a little bit differently. Just like previous exam, you will have a five point extra credit question on the actual exam. Your choice if you want to answer it or not. Uh, but notice I said here that the extra credit is up to 15 points. You can earn 10 points of extra credit just like last exam by completing the worksheets, those problem solving documents that we did. There are only two uh, of those documents that we have done for module exam two. Uh, they are already live on Canvas. You can see them under lecture recordings. You can see the heading start of module exam two. You can see the first worksheet titled reactions, <clears> third <throat> 12 pages, and then today's a document, the mole, whenever it loads, which is around 11 pages. So complete it in full, you get five points per packet. Submit both, that is 10 points. So in total, if you also attempt the extra credit on the exam, you can get up to 15 points of extra credit. <clears throat> the only addendum is that the work, these problem sheets, the fully completing them, they are actually due the night before the exam, not after. The last time I gave you the extra credit opportunity after seeing the average, we're not going to do that this time. You must submit the completed worksheets Monday night. You can see the due date is March 18th for both of the extra credit opportunities. And I will not be accepting any submissions after the exam. Great. Are there any questions on what the exam is going to look like? And they clarify questions about the extra credit. Wait, wait, the exam one? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Any questions or anything else? Really and truly, the only big difference is the extra credit opportunity for the second exam. Uh, it will now be offered and closed before the exam even starts. <clears throat> okay. With that in hand, let's move straight into today's pro uh, practice for module exam two. Uh, that is a packet that everyone should have right now. If you don't have a packet, is anyone who does it for me don't have a packet? <laughs> No point in you walking all the way back down here. Yeah. 
Okay, first and foremost, I'd like to point out two things. Uh, number one, you can see here on the first page, this particular question is technically from module exam one, uh, because last year I had a different sort of schedule. So you see I've labeled it module exam one, problem five. Pro uh, module exam two actually begins here with problem one. Okay. The other thing that I will mention is problem five onwards. We have not covered that in class yet. So problem five onwards is not applicable to your next exam. <clears throat> so again, to be clear, you can ignore page seven. This is problem five. You can also ignore page eight, problem six. And the first page is a question from uh, module exam one. Okay, so let's go through it a little bit at a time. Talk about what you could expect and how to approach these types of questions on the exam. The first question, of course, asks us to predict the products for each of the reactions below. Be sure to include the correct state symbols and balance the equation. Kind of give you some context. Uh, each of these little rubrics are worth one point. I think it's something like that. No, like two points. Yeah. Okay, to kind of give you an idea of how they're all weighted against each other. Ultimately, we, this is what the, the, the goal should be. By the end of the, the, the process, we should have a complete reaction that has the products, has the correct state symbols, and balance the equation. Before we start doing the, uh, the specific conversion, predict the products, in this particular case, we have to convert the written names to formula. Again, this is a remnant of last semester's exam where we did nomenclature and the reactions. I'm not going to give this to you on this exam. I would actually write sodium and the magnesium chloride. Okay. So obviously we want to convert that. Sodium as an element, we know that it's solid based on its location on the periodic table. And then we have magnesium chloride, which by the solubility rules, you'll note is aqueous. Okay. So as of right now, all we've done is to simply convert the reactants from their written names to their formulae. Now we should be able to predict the products of the reaction. Of course, the first thing to do is try to identify which generic reaction you're going to use. You've learned two of them. Uh, of course, you've learned the A, B plus C, D rule. And you've also learned the, the single displacement rule where a single element displaces another. When you compare the two generic reactions, you should know almost immediately this particular reaction model is the second one, the single displacement. You can tell, right, because A, there is only one element, okay, no, no two elements, and B, C, two elements, two ions, also represented right here. So using that generic reaction, we're just going to write it down here. We're going to have A plus B, C, and that gives us uh, a, C plus B. All right, before I move on, I'd like to point something out. How do I know it's going to be A, C? Why isn't it, for example, B, A? Well, sort of intuitively, you should at this point be able to recognize that sodium is going to form a cation. So it will most likely replace the cation. Think about the difference in order between B, A, and A, uh, uh, and A, C. Okay, based on Tuesday's lab, it seems some people are still having a little bit of an issue follow, uh, understanding the steps to follow. So we're gonna break it down slowly here. The first thing we want to do is match the elements and their respective ions. That is the first thing we want to do. I am not going to consider balancing. I'm not going to consider charging. I am just matching, okay. Looking at our labels, A, C, that is sodium and chlorine. Those are two ions. I simply match them. We have NaCl. And then, of course, B is all that's left. In this case, it's just magnesium. So that would be plus Mg. At this point, all I've done is match the A, B, and A, C, all that stuff. I just matched them. Now I want to confirm that my structures are correct, that my formulae make sense. Looking at sodium chloride, I know that sodium is in group one, so it's plus one. 
I know that chlorine is in group seven, so it's negative one. These charges are balanced. This formula is correct as is. Looking at magnesium, of course, it ends up as a single element, so not much real check you need to do there. All right. So now we have matched the re matched the ions. We have confirmed their charges. As of right now, we have completed the predicting the products. It doesn't matter the order in which you do state symbols or balancing. Uh, I'm going to do state symbols first right now. Uh, of course, in this particular case, they had to convert the names to words. Uh, I'm sorry, the names to formulae, so they had to figure it out. But on this exam, like I said, I will be giving you the reactants in this form. Okay, so I will be specifying the reactants uh, state symbols. So it's on you to recognize the state symbols of the product. Solubility rules tells us that sodium chloride is aqueous. Of course, magnesium is a single element. So you refer to the periodic table. It says it's a metal, AKA solid. And just like that, we have completed predicting the products. We have completed the state symbols. Now we should check if the reaction is balanced and if it is not balanced, we need to balance it. Looking at sodium first, one sodium on the left, one sodium on the right, check, check. One magnesium on the left, one magnesium on the right, check, check. Two chlorines on the left, but only one on the right. That is not balanced. Chlorine is the only issue. So to fix that, we just put a two in front of the NaCl, no problem. In doing so though, we have also changed the amount of sodiums. Now there's two sodiums on the right and only one on the left. Fortunately, again, no big deal. We just put a two on the left. And if I just erase this, this is of course what your answer is going to look like. A complete reaction that clearly tells me what the products are that ter clearly tells me the balancing, that clearly tells me the state symbols. Okay. We're gonna try part B together. I'm gonna speed it up a bit, try to make the connections really quickly. Of course, let's start by converting the names to formulae. Uh, barium chloride BaCl2 plus K3PO4 for potassium phosphate. If I remember correctly, I think that barium chloride is aqueous. And uh, so is the phosphate molecule. Okay. All right. We quickly recognize that this is more akin to the AB plus CD generic reaction. So using the generic reaction, we can first match our elements slash ions. Not worrying about charge, not worrying about balancing. We're going to put A and B together. In this case, this is BAPO4. I'm not worrying about balancing just yet. I'm just putting ions together. And in the case of CB, we have KCl. Okay, now they're matched together. Let's answer a couple of questions. Number one, why did I keep PO4 and not Cl2? Why did I keep PO4, that number four, but I did not keep the CL2? The reason for that is that PO4 is a polyatomic ion. It is its own unit. It is regarded as a single ion. It is simply polyatomic. It just has multiple atoms. So for polyatomic ions, we must remember to keep them consistent. Chlorine is not a polyatomic ion. So you just keep it as Cl. Similarly, potassium is not a polyatomic ion. So you keep it as is. All right. We've matched the elements. Now let's check charges. Potassium is in group one. So it's K plus. Cl is in group uh, six. I'm sorry, seven. So it's negative one. Charges are equal as is. This is fine. In other words, by matching the elements, we have also accidentally stumbled upon the correct formula. Looking at the next case, barium phosphate. Barium is in group two, so 
So we know it's BA2+. Plus. PO4 is a polyatomic ion. We know that to be PO4 three minus. Charges are not the same. So we use the crisscross method. This means I'm going to have to erase and rewrite it. Of course, the correct structure is BA3, PO4, 2. Let me write that a bit clearer. I apologize. Plus KCL. There are two documents. I don't know if the last picture just came in. Two, there's a packet down there you can grab. <clears throat> okay. Matched ions. Checked formula. We predicted the product. Now let's do state symbols. Looking at the solubility rules, KCL is aqueous. And if I remember correctly, I believe potassium phosphate to be solid. If I'm incorrect on that, could someone just correct me? State symbols are now done. Now we're going to balance. I'm going to kind of just erase some stuff to make it a bit cleaner to look at. Uh, obviously, one of the first things to notice is that we're sort of working with multiple numbers, like three, right? So it's not as, if, you, if you'd like to break it down, you know, how we did in class practice like this, that's absolutely fine. But we're just going to go through it all at once. Starting with barium. Uh, barium, there's three on the right. There's one on the left. To balance this out, we just put a three on the left. Okay, all right, since we're going in order, now we can see that with the new three, we actually have six chlorines on the left and only one on the right. No biggie to balance that out, we just put a six on the product side. Next up, we have potassium right here. Uh, we have three potassiums on the left and we actually have six on the right. And no worries there, we just put a two in front of the K3PO4. Continuing in order, now we have two phosphates. And lo and behold, we also have two phosphates on the right. By fortuitous to luck, we have balanced the polyatomic ion on intention. The reaction as is, is complete, balanced, and has state symbols. Keep it going. Moving on to C, okay? First things first, again, I'll remind you, I will not give you the written names on the exam. I'll give you the formula. Let's do that quick conversion. This will be PbOH2, which I remember to be solid, and sodium nitrate, which I know to be aqueous. Okay. All right, again, here we have a case of AB plus CD. Try to get in the habit of doing that quick pattern recognition. You should already be able to see that the lead is going to end up with the nitrate. Putting them together, this becomes PbNO3. And then we know that the sodium is going to end up with the hydroxide. And that's how we get sodium hydroxide. Again, we see the cases where if it's a polyatomic ion, we keep the entire polyatomic ion. But in cases where it is not a polyatomic ion, we do not. We leave it as is. Okay. So far, what we've done is simply match the reactants and ions. Let's check to see if the molecules make sense. Starting with sodium hydroxide. We know sodium to be in group one. It's plus one. OH is a polyatomic ion of negative one. Charges are balanced. The formula is correct as is. Looking at uh, lead and nitrate, we of course, like again, this was for their exam. They of course knew that in this particular reaction, I've assigned the lead to be two plus. So the PB is two plus and the nitrate is a single negative. They are not matte, they're not the same charges. So we have to use crisscross. Upon using crisscross, we see we end up with two nitrates. We have predicted the products. Moving on to state symbols. Checking the solubility rules. Nitrates are all soluble. They're all aqueous. Sodium hydroxide is also aqueous. Okay. Now let's balance the reaction. 
Starting from the left, we have one PB on the left. We have one PB on the right. That's fine as is. We have two OHs on the left, but only one on the right. Balance that, we just put a two on the product side. Now we have one sodiums on the left. I'm sorry, one sodium, one sodium on the left, and two on the right. To quickly balance that, we just put a two in front of the NaNO3. Now we have two nitrates and sweet serendipity. That's also already balanced. My recommendation to you, and I, and I told this to the Tuesday lab, you know, start with the simplest element. You know, the, 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 the easiest one to identify. For example, in this case, I think the easiest one is lead. <clears throat> in general, try to stay away from using polyatomics first. It might, it might be a little bit of a hassle. Okay. Oh. Yeah, let me... <clears throat> Where the hell? Oh, okay. All right. Moving on to part D, this simply says combustion of C5H12. For those who can't see it, I'll zoom in a sec. C5H12. All right, combustion of C5H12. Uh, you should recognize that compound to look like CXHY. This is one of those reactions that I taught you will always have the same products. So the, the, the whoops. So the reactants will be burned and we represent burning using oxygen. These two will react together and no matter what, no matter the, the carbon, they will always form the same products, CO2 and H2O. Always. Okay. You don't need to check any charges. You don't need to do any A, B plus C, D. Combustion will always lead to these two products. <clears throat> Combustion will always lead to those two products. Filling in the state symbols, uh, again, difference to last year, this is actually a uh, aqueous. Oxygen, of course, is a gas, yeah? Okay. Oxygen, of course, is a gas. You should know carbon dioxide to also be a gas. And of course, water is the only liquid, the only one that will ever have an L. Okay, now that we have the stated symbols, now we can balance the equation. Starting with carbons, we have five on the left, one on the right. Let's put a five on the right. Keeping it going. We have 12 hydrogens on the left, but only two on the right. Keep it going, we just put a six in front of the H2O. Or in the case of oxygen, we have in total, we have two oxygens on the left, and in total, we have 16 oxygens on the right. Please pay attention to the subscript numbers and the balancing has affected things. With two on the left and 16 on the right, all we need to do is put an eight in front of the O2. Okay. <clears throat> Moving on to E. Let's do the first quick conversion. Aluminum sulfate is Al3 plus. This is AlSO43 plus lead nitrate. I remember this one to be aqueous, and I'm pretty sure this one is also aqueous. Yeah, it's also, yeah, I remember that. Cool. Okay. Pattern recognition at this point. We know we're going to have aluminum and the nitrate end up together. And then we'll have the lead and the sulfate end up together. All I've done is match the reactants. I'm not worrying about charge or balance. And if you still can't see it, you have A, B plus C, D. A matches up with D, B matches up with C. All right, now let's check to see the charges make sense. We know aluminum to be in group three, so it's three plus. You know nitrate to be negative one. To balance this to be a crisscross, we need three of the nitrates. 
Looking at the next one, PBS04, as defined in the question, the lead is two plus, and sulfate is a polyatomic ion of two minus. The charges are the same. We assume one to one. It is correct as is. Putting on state symbols, all nitrates are aqueous. And if I remember correctly, I believe this lead sulfate is a solid. Someone could fact check me. And if I'm wrong, please let me know. Predicted the products, included state symbols. Now it's time to balance. Starting from left to right, there are two aluminums on the left. There's one aluminum on the right. A balance that we just put a two. In total, we have three of the sulfates. There are three in total, but there's only one on the right. The balance that we just put a three in front of the PBSO4. Now for lead, we have one on the left, three on the right. So we just put a three in front. Now we have in total six nitrates on the left. And sweet serendipity, six nitrates on the right. Yet again, we've come in a situation that we automatically balance everything just by going through the steps. Okay, that was a lot. Take a second, look over the questions, look over the answers. If you need me to zoom in, please let me know. <clears throat> Take a couple of seconds to digest. <clears throat> All right. Does anyone have any questions on anyone that we just did? I know I pretty much just talked at you. That's kind of the point I wanted to just sort of just get straight into it. Anything confusing? Okay, great. All right, now we're actually doing last year's second exam. We're starting with it. Problem number one is ionic equations. The question asks us to provide complete balanced net ionic equations for the following reactions with state symbols. If no net ionic equation exists, please state so. Okay. Since we now have had a lot of practice making the full equation on the previous page, I am going to just go ahead and give you the full equation here. On your own time, I recommend you try it yourself to see if you get the same answer. Okay, so... Uh, so the... the, the, the the molecular equation, so just EQN I'm going to write, is sodium chloride NaCl, which is aqueous, added to lead to nitrate, which I also remember to be aqueous. And I know my products are going to be NaNO3, which is aqueous, and PbCl2, which I know to be solid. All right, sodium is fine, the nitrate is not fine. So we just got to put two right here and a two right here. Great. Okay. So like I said, I'm just going to give you the full equation, the regular equation. You can uh, deduce how I got there on your own time. Okay, so this is the full equation that is balanced, state symbols and products. It shows you the bare minimum information. To get a net ionic equation, careful of that word net, you go from the regular equation to the complete ionic, and from the complete ionic, you go to the net ionic. And it is in this last process, this last step, and I'm writing it small, I apologize, but that is where you get rid of the spectator ions. Okay, so the complete ionic equation, you see here that I've just written it as CI. 
the complete ionic equation splits all aqueous species. Only aqueous. If it is not aqueous, it is not split. So from left to right, starting with sodium chloride, the complete ionic is 2 Na two Na plus, 2 Cl minus, plus Pb2 plus, uh, all right, 2 NO3 minus to give us 2 Na plus, 2 NO3 minus, plus PbCl2, which is left as is because it is a solid. We do not split solids. For the purposes of this worked example, please notice I just do not have enough space to put the state symbols. It'll get really congested. But of course, you should recognize that if the atom or element is split, that is a direct implication that it is aqueous. Stephen, is that a question? Yeah. Very good, because in this particular question, I did define it as a two. Uh, so again, this was last year. There was a different sort of uh, schedule how I talk. Okay. Finally, from here, we can then generate the net ionic equation. To generate the net ionic equation, we eliminate the spectators. The spectators are those that do not actively participate. They are just there. In other words, they are unchanged. From left to right, sodium starts aqueous, it ends up aqueous. That is unchanged and eliminated. Chlorine starts aqueous, it ends up part of a solid species that is a change, you leave it alone. Lead starts off aqueous, it ends up part of a solid that is a change, you leave it alone. Nitrate starts char I'm sorry, starts aqueous, ends up aqueous. That is not changed. It is eliminated. Again, notice I do not have the state symbols. You should immediately know that by writing it in its charged form, it's aqueous. So really and truly, all this step is is this matching. The net ionic equation is what's left. 2 Cl minus plus Pb2 plus gives us PbCl2. And of course, in this particular exam, I did tell them uh, to include state symbols. So to be abundantly clear, what is in the box is the answer. This is what I'm looking for. You do not need to show me the breakdown, like the equation of the complete. Go ahead and write it, of course. You know, if you need, uh, if you need to do it, by all means. But this is the final answer. Any questions on this? All right, you can try B on your own time for a little practice. Let's move on to C for the interest of time. <clears throat> We're doing the kind of the conversion for you. Uh, this is iron three chloride, this FeCl three, which I know to be aqueous, and magnesium, which I know to be solid. Uh, looking at the final periodic table, final answer, we know this to be magnesium chloride, which I know to be aqueous, and of course iron, which I know to be solid. To balance this out, I put a two over here, a three right here, three right here, and a two. Okay, this is a complete, <coughs> this is a complete um, equation. Now we can generate the complete ionic equation from it. Just as above, we only split the aqueous species. We do not split non-aqueous. From left to right, we have two Fe three plus six Cl minus, plus three MG, recognize that MG is a solid, so it is uh, not split. Then three MG, two plus six CL minus, plus two FE.
Now we check for spectator arms. That's what's unchanged. From left to right, iron starts aqueous. It ends up a solid. That is a change. We leave it alone. Chlorine starts aqueous, it ends up aqueous. That is unchanged, therefore we eliminate. Magnesium starts solid and ends up aqueous. That is a change. This is not the direction you're used to, but it is still a change. So magnesium is left alone. The final answer, the net ionic equation is what's left. That's going to be 2Fe3+, plus, which is aqueous, plus 3 magnesium, which is solid. They give us 3Mg2+, plus, plus 2Fe solid. I would like to explicitly point out that the balancing is maintained all the way through meaning I can clearly see from start to finish that there are two irons. I can clearly see from start to finish that there are, uh, well, the chlorine is eliminated, but there are six chlorines in total. In other words, please remember that the final answer is balanced. Okay. Let's do E. I'll skip over D so you can practice that on your own time. Magnesium on the right is a solid. I'm sorry. The magnesium on the right is aqueous, yes. But it started solid. So that is the change. Yeah. Okay. Moving on to E, lithium hydroxide, LiOH, which I know to be aqueous, plus barium chloride, which I also know to be aqueous. That will give us lithium chloride, which I know to be aqueous, and barium hydroxide, which I also know to be aqueous. To balance this out, we put a two in front of the lithium and a two right there. Okay. I've gone ahead and given you the reaction. It may not immediately jump out at you, but what do you notice about the states? The state symbols from the left to the right, they're all the same. You can see just from this starting equation, there is no change. There's nothing for you to investigate. So without even putting in all the effort, you should already realize no net ionic equation exists. For this particular reaction. Again, you could have actually put in the work and realized that all the spectators are eliminated, but you could have also quickly noticed there is absolutely no change of state. Do we have any questions on this? Yes. Uh, just like on the problem solving document, uh, I can, I'll just answer your question out loud. <clears throat> to be clear to everyone, this is pretty much what the, any question related to predictive products is going to look like. You can see up here, provide a complete balanced equation. I've given you the state symbols and the formulae for the reactants, but clearly it is not balanced. So this is almost exactly what it's going to look like. Yeah. Any other questions on this? All right, uh, next problem, problem two, deals with empirical and molecular formula. We are doing a problem solving session on this. So for right now, we're gonna skip this question. We also skip that one. Now we're on problem number three. Uh, again, that's page five. <clears throat> for each of the reactions below, uh, do the following. In order, part number one is asking you to write and label the balanced half oxidation reduction reaction. I've outright told you that state symbols are not necessary. I've also outright told you that all elements are in their reference state. Again, as a reminder, reference means naturally occurring. So sodium is a metal. It naturally exists as a solid. So if it's a sodium solid, it is zero charge. 
Using the changes in oxidation numbers, please determine which element is oxidized, which is reduced. And then finally identify the oxidizing agent and reducing agent. Let's actually draw this table up just like what you're gonna see on the exam. We have strontium on the left, oxygen on the right. I just arbitrarily picked either column. Uh, and I'm gonna answer them in order, number one, number two, and number three. Before we start, I would like to point out that the reaction is balanced. It is you, I'm already balanced, I'm sorry. It is on you to identify if the reaction is already balanced or if you need to balance it. <clears throat> okay. First one's asking us to write the half reactions. That's the one that shows where the electrons go and stuff. So let's look at this particular case, starting with strontium. I've already said to assume all elements are in their reference state. Their reference, that means their charge is zero. You can see that strontium starts neutral, zero, and it ends up plus two. How do we know that's why it happens? Well, first and foremost, it's now part of a compound. We've talked about bonding. We know for a compound to exist, electrons have to be gone around somewhere. We also see strontium is in group two. That's why we know it's plus two. Next up, we have oxygen. This is an example again of when it's a reference naturally occurring state. Oxygen exists as O2. So it also has a charge of zero. Using the same logic, it is in group six. Therefore, it is negative two charge in the process. Upon identifying the charges, I can now do the reactions. Starting with strontium, I see that strontium starts neutral and it ends up positively charged. So if it ends up positively charged, it had to have lost electrons. If you lost electrons, that implies that the electrons should be on the product side plus 2e and of course we know that it is two electrons because we know that strontium forms two plus all right looking at oxygen we know that oxygen starts off neutral we know that it ends up uh, o2 minus the only way for this to happen is to gain electrons if you're gaining electrons, that must mean that the electrons should be on the reactant side. And here again, we know that it's two electrons because the charge is two minus. Okay. However, it is not balanced. You may be wondering, well, what do you mean it's not balanced? You, you just said that the two electrons come here and don't they match? Well, let's take a look at the oxygen. Technically speaking over here, we have two oxygens on the left and only one on the right. So yeah, the electrons might be balanced, but not the overall molecule. You don't need to put in much effort to balance the half reactions because of course it's already balanced up here. You just need to reflect that. Looking at the given equation, we see that we start with two strontiums. Okay, so that must be reflected in the answer. Two strontiums become two strontium ions. Each strontium is losing two electrons, so therefore this must be four. Looking at oxygen, there's two oxygens on the left. Well, to fix that, we just put a two on the right. We see that reflected in the actual reaction. The problem, the balancing does match. And if each oxygen gains two electrons and there are two oxygens in total, it's actually four electrons. And of course it is still balanced in terms of electrons. It is also now balanced in terms of element number. Part two asks us to identify which elements are oxidized slash reduced. 
looking at the given reactions, we can identify that strontium lost electrons. That means it's oxidation. As a reminder, the mnemonic we use is oil rig. That stands for oxidation is loss. Reduction is gain. Oil rig. Looking at oxygen, you could also use process of elimination, of course, but looking at O2, it clearly gains electrons. So this is a reduction. And to finally identify the agent, remember that's simply the opposite of what happened to it. So if the strontium is oxidized, it is the reducing agent. Similarly speaking, if oxygen is reduced, it is the oxidizing agent. It might seem a little weird because you're thinking, well, I don't really understand how you're just flipping the opposite now. You're, you're saying it's oxidized, but it's also a reducing agent. Keep in mind that number two is asking what happened to the strontium. It's asking what happened to the oxygen. In the last case, it is asking you, what is the role of strontium? What is the role of oxygen? Strontium exists to oxygen, sorry, so that oxygen can get reduced. Oxygen exists so that strontium can get uh, oxidized. Okay. All right, we've, I think we've done B before. Let's quickly do uh, C. All right, check for ourselves. It is balanced, two cesiums, two bromines. Great, so it's already balanced. Uh, that's the tablet. I can just copy back my table. All right, the elements that are specifically involved here are, are CS as in cesium and bromine. Br two. Let me erase some of these things. So I have the space. Okay. Looking at the given reaction, cesium is of course an element assumed to be in its reference state, so therefore the charge is neutral. Same thing can be said for the bromine. We can see based on the periodic table, cesium becomes a plus one charge, bromine becomes a negative one charge. The half reactions are as follows. Cesium starts neutral and it ends up positive. To end up positive, it had to have lost electrons. If you lose electrons, they're products. Bromine starts off neutral and it ends up negative one. Based on the charge, we know that it gains one electron. Pretty quickly, we should see that this is not balanced, but we can just quickly refer to the given question. There are two cesiums, so there are two cesium ions, and there are two cesium electrons. Similarly speaking, on the left, for the products, for the bromine side, there are two on the left, there's two on the right. And if each bromine is getting an electron, that means in total, we have two electrons being added. Here we see that the reaction is overall balanced in terms of atoms. It's also balanced in terms of electrons. Okay. Now we identify which one is oxidized and reduced. Starting with cesium, we've already said that cesium loses electrons. If it loses electrons, it is oxidation. And just by identifying this one answer, we can fill everything else out by a process of elimination. Because if the cesium is oxidized, then the bromine must be reduced. It's one or the other. If the cesium is oxidized, it is the reducing agent. 
And by the same logic slash uh, process elimination, the bromine must be the oxidizing agent. Do we have any questions on this? Okay. Uh, in the interest of time, you can practice the rest of them on your own. Problem number four deals with moles. Again, which we're about to do in a problem solving session. It is 9.55. Let's take a five minute break. Let's reconvene at uh, 10 a.m. 10 a.m. to continue. It's going to pause. Recording in progress. Mike is working. Okay. Just handed out another packet. If anyone came in more recently, does everyone have a packet? A new packet has a whole big table on the first page. Oh. <clears throat> so, this is the other uh, problem solving worksheet that if you would like the extra credit, you should complete. And of course, we're not gonna be doing the entire thing. <clears throat> Let's work through some questions together. You can do some on your own. So we can kind of get in the process for it. Do you have a, do you have a, one of the, okay. cool. All right, hopefully we have our calculators out. Okay. Problem one, calculate the molar mass of the compounds below. Based on the given table, I first give you the compound name, you convert it to the formula, and then you uh, calculate the molar mass. This is to force you to ensure that you have the correct formula, because of course, if you don't have the correct formula, the mass will be wrong. For the purposes of today, because I see it, I'm gonna be using the masses from the periodic table on the wall. Uh, again, remember if you're using your own document, there may be some slight decimal differences. Okay, let's get straight into it. Uh, starting with water, a really simple one. Uh, water, we know the chemical formula to be H2O. Therefore, the molar mass is two hydrogens added to one oxygen. Looking at the periodic table, uh, we see that each hydrogen is approximately one gram. And each oxygen is approximately 16 grams. In total, the molar mass is 18 grams per mole. Let's keep it going with another straightforward one, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is CO2. The molar mass can be calculated by the mass of carbon added to the mass of two oxygens. Uh, this is going to be equal to 12 plus 2 times 16. This gives us 44 grams per mole. I, uh, I recognize my handwriting may be a little weird. This looks like a zero, but you should recognize that I'm, I'm intending to write a, an oxygen. <clears throat> Keep me going for part C. I'm sorry, uh, question C, sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is NaCl. The molar mass must therefore be equal to the sum of one chlorine and one sodium. Looking at the periodic table, sodium is approximately 23 grams. Chlorine is, when rounded, 35 grams. This gives us a total of 58 grams per mole. With these three as an example, I would like for you to calculate molar mass of calcium carbonate on your own. I provided you the correct formula. And of course, recognize that this is an oxygen. Calculate the molar mass of, <clears throat> of calcium carbonate, please. Take a couple more.
while you're all working, please don't forget that problem set two is due tomorrow night, Friday night. Covers chapters six, seven, and eight. So all of reactions and molds. Okay, I'll help you out for this one. Let's start. Uh, of course, you should recognize that the mass is going to be the sum of carbon added to car. I'm sorry. Calcium added to carbon added to three oxygens. Recognize that there is no bracket around the CO. So we're not saying there, there are three carbons in total. <clears throat> Specifically, there are three oxygens. Looking at the periodic table, we can say that calcium is approximately 40 grams. Carbon is 12 grams. And of course, for oxygen, it's three times 16. Uh, three times 16 is uh, 48 plus 12, which is 60. Okay, then 40 is 100 grams per mole. All right, let's keep it going. Magnesium oxide, you should be able to identify that magnesium is oxidized formula is simply MgO. The mass must therefore be the, the sum of magnesium and oxygen. Looking at the periodic table, we get 24 plus 16. This is approximately 40 grams per mole. Okay. I would like to do J and K next. Joking and kidding, J and K because they're transition metals. <clears throat> okay, so clearly the first thing you notice is the fact that there are Roman numerals. And we know what the Roman numerals tells us. The Roman numerals tells us what charges of that element. So in the case of copper, we know that the copper is two plus. We should recognize sulfate as SO4 two minus. Charges are balanced. Therefore, the formula is simply Cu SO4. Similarly speaking, in the case of K, we know that this is iron three plus, because the Roman numeral is three. We know in general, oxygen is two minus. Charges are not the same. So we use the crisscross method. This becomes Fe2O3. Going back to J, let's finish the mass. Uh, calculating mass, we see that, let me see, it's copper plus sulfur plus four oxygens. Looking at the periodic table, that is 64 grams plus 32 plus four times 16. Uh, this is 40, what is it? 64, 64, so 128 plus 32, this is 160 grams. As a reminder, I'm using the periodic table that's on the wall just for ease. If your particular document may have some slight differences in math, but you should basically get the same number. For iron oxide, there are two irons, and of course there are three oxygens. Looking at the periodic table, we get two times 56 for the iron and three times 16 for the oxygen. That's 48 plus 112. This is gonna be 160 grams. Per mole, sorry. Okay, take a quick detour. Notice that in each case, I've been using grams per mole. I would like to make it clear that this is the unit used when, you are, when you've calculated the molar mass. If, for example, on a question I say, uh, oh, we're actually going to use 4.8 grams of iron oxide, this is clearly not the molar mass. So it is just grams. But specifically when you get the molar mass number, 
it is grams per mole. Do also notice that in this, these last two questions, the molar mass is the same or approximately the same. This does happen. It's not something to worry about. Tuesday's lecture, where I compared the mole to chemical currency. So basically what I'm saying is that these are different unit dollars. So for example, one mole in copper sulfate dollars is 160. One mole of iron oxide in, in that dollars is 160 as well. Okay. We did a couple of them. Uh, are there any questions on our calculations? Again, please recognize that if you have, do not have the correct formula, you're not going to get the correct mass. Okay. I would like to do one more, actually. We just did iron three oxide. I would like to do uh, question P. P is in Peter, where it is iron two oxide. Let us see for ourselves if what the charge affects the mass. From the Roman numeral, we know that iron will be two plus, and we know that in general, oxygen is two minus. Pretty quickly that we see that the charges are balanced. So it is one to one, we simply write FeO. The molar mass is therefore equal to the sum of iron and oxygen, which when looking at the periodic table is 56 plus 16 to give us 72 grams per mole. So in short, does charge affect mass? Yes. The charge affects the mass because it affects the formula. And it's the formula that determines molar mass. Anything else there I would like to do? Yes, let's do Z as in zebra. I would like for you to do Z as in zebra by yourself. 10, 12, take like, I would say two minutes. Again, that Z as in zebra, let me actually just put a finger on it. You know what we're doing? Oh. Yes. No, this is just practice with me calculating moles. Yeah. No, this is just practice. This particular question is practice. Recognize that there are, you can always forget if it's prefix or suffix, but the di and the tetra, they tell you immediately how many of each atom or element is present. So getting the formula should just be as simple as reading the name. Don't need to worry about charges or balancing because it's in the name. <clears throat> Take another minute.
All right, 1015. Getting the formula is just by reading the name. We can tell from dinitrogen that this is uh, N2 from the tetroxide. We know that that is going to be N2O4. <clears throat> now, to calculate the molar mass, that will be two times nitrogen added to four times oxygen. Looking at the periodic table, that is two times 14 plus four times 16. 64 plus 28, this looks to be 91. 91 grams per mole. Okay. Does anyone have any questions on calculating molar mass? Hopefully we see the process, right? Formula to mass is just keeping track of the number of atoms. Okay. Moving on, let's start problem two. Now, this is exactly how it's going to look on the exam. Solve the following questions using the provided aids. I would like to make it clear from right now. The aids that I'm giving you are this, the, 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 the template to where you can write the known and unknown uh, expressions. These are optional to fill up. A lot of students might appreciate having that way to organize their thoughts. If you don't need to do that, if you're at the point where you can sort of do it on a calculator pretty quickly, by all means, but you, you, the, you do not have to fill out the known and unknown expressions. I'm only really looking at the final answer over here. Okay, before we get into the specific question, let's do a little recap so we understand what we're coming from. On Tuesday's lecture, I compared the mole to currency, to $1, where the mole simply exists as a very simple, easily understandable way to relate things. I told you that one mole of anything is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23 of that anything, which could either be an atom, which is a single element, or a compound, which would be molecule. This is what's known as Avogadro's number. This is a constant. The other thing we went through was how to calculate, we just did it, how to calculate the molar mass. We know that one mole is described as the molar mass of a compound. If we have these two sort of setups where we have A equal B and A equal C, then we can assume A is equal to B, which is equal to C. In other words, we can relate B and C, something which we have not related yet. And we know, we just quickly match, what B equals C is saying is that 6.02 times 10 to the 23 of anything is also equal to the molar mass of that anything. So these are the three sort of known expressions that you should be referring back to. One mole is equal to Avogadro's number. One mole is equal to the molecular, the molar mass of that compound. Or you can equate the Avogadro's number to the molar mass. Let me highlight them to make it even uh, more clear. Okay. Now that we sort of have our equations handy, let's now approach the question starting with the first one. It's asking how many grams How many grams are in X amount of molecules of PO2? Sorry, if that's a bit small. Let me zoom in a bit so you guys can see better. How many grams are in that amount of molecules of PO2? All right. So now we, to know how we should approach this, we check our three expressions. And we see, is there one of these we can use that tells us something about grams and molecules. Starting from the first one, 
one mole is equal to 6.023. Well, sort of straight off the bat, it doesn't really seem like it'll help. Next up, one mole of anything is equal to the molar mass of compound. This doesn't even mention the word molecules. So we can ignore that. The last one, though, tells us that Avogadro's number is equal to the mass of the compound. So now this expression over here on the right is something we know. Of course, we know Avogadro's number that is a constant, but we can also calculate the molar mass of PO2. That's information we can deduce. So first thing to do is calculate the molar mass of PO2, which is a sum of one phosphorus and two oxygens. Looking at the periodic table, this is going to be 31 plus 2 times 16. 32 plus 31. This is going to be equal to 63 grams per mole. Okay, great. So just by doing a quick calculation of the molar mass, we can use the last relationship right here and write it down. In other words, we know... That's 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules is equal to the molar mass of the compound, which we've already calculated to be 63 grams per mole. I'll just write 63. Please note that it does not matter left or right, which one you have, because you're still equating them together. However, you should maintain the same unit on either side, AKA, if we're talking about molecules on the left, there should also be molecules down here. So the unknown expression now is, we know how many molecules we're working with. It is as 1.2 times 10 to the 23. We want to know how many grams is that, is that many molecules. That's what we want to know. So now we have quite ideally, we filled out our expression. We clearly see that we're missing just one thing. We can then cross multiply. <clears throat> and to get the final answer, we just get X is equal to 63 times 1.2 times 10 to the 23, all over 6.02 times 10 to the 23. Recognize that I've kind of skipped ahead and divided both sides by the 6.02. If someone could calculate that for me and tell me the answer to two decimal places, that would be great. More practice using your calculators. Be careful of the brackets and the exponents. Once we have the answer, just shout it out. Again, to two decimal places. Right, 12.56. If anyone got a conflicting answer, speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay, we all agreed. Fantastic. Okay, so this is a very math heavy portion. It's very easy to sort of get lost in the numbers of it all. Right? Even just our little working out, it's really complicated just to look at. That's why using these known and unknown expressions is really, the blank expressions is really useful because you can fill this out using information in the question and it allows you to sort of gather your thoughts. So I really like using these expressions. I encourage you to fill them out. 
but like I did say, technically it is optional. I, I'm not requiring it for full credit. Okay, uh, moving on to the second question. It is asking how many grams are in that many molecules of MGBr2? This is pretty much identical fundamentally to the first question. So I would like for you all to attempt the second question on your own, following my process for the first. It's 1025 uh, in the interest of time, because we do want to do some empirical formula stuff. Let's uh, give yourself three minutes. Notice that nowhere in this question did I say anything about significant figures or scientific notation. So it is that is not something you have to worry about. You can write all of the decimal places. You can write two decimal places. It doesn't matter because I have not specified anything about that. I usually default to two decimal places. But that's my preference. Okay, 1028, let's get straight into it. How many grams are in that many molecules? Clearly, like I said, it's very similar to the one above. So you already know your known, your known expression states that there are 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules in the molar mass of that molecule. Hopefully you did calculate the molar mass. Uh, it should be approximately, what is that? 160 plus 24. So I would say approximately 184 grams. I do that right? Yes, 80 plus 80 plus, yeah, okay, cool. Okay, the unknown is we're being asked, well, specifically we have 11.5 times 10 to the 23 molecules. We wanna know how much does that weigh? Cross multiplication then leads us to the following expression. We get X is equal to 184 times 11.5 times 10 to the 23. And this is all over 6.023 times 10 to the 23. If someone got the answer, could you just please shout it out to uh, two decimal places? 20 seconds, thank you. 20 seconds, okay. If anyone has the answer, just please shout it out to two decimal places. I heard 35.15, do we have any conflicting answers? No, okay. All right, in the interest of time, I definitely wanna do a couple of empirical formula questions. So we're gonna do a couple of those and we'll come back to this if we have time. <clears throat> we're now on page eight. 
The first couple of these practice questions are straight from last year's exam. So by leaving it blank on the, the exam we printed, uh, we're doing it here. You can practice on your own time using those blanks. Okay. Solve the following questions. The percentage, comp the percentage composition of a compound was found to be those numbers, with those atoms. Let me highlight them so we can make it clear. Nitrogen, silver, and oxygen. Using these percentages, please determine the compound's empirical formula. Okay. Now, the empirical formula is a table. That's the first thing we're going to do. We're going to draw our table. Each element is its own column. So we have one for oxygen, for nitrogen. Well, that's too, that's too narrow. For nitrogen, and then finally, I don't like how this looks. I kind of think this is it. Okay, that's fine with me, I guess. All right. <clears throat> we know the elements involved are silver, nitrogen, and oxygen. We know that from the question. We're going to label on the left our different headings. Uh, the first thing we want to record is, uh, I'm sorry, rec uh, note is the relative percentages. This is straight from the question, so we're just writing it down. This is 63.5. 8.2 and then 28.3. If you put this in your calculator, if you add them all up, uh, you'll see that it is equal to 100 grams. I'm sorry, 100%. From here, uh, we assume the mass to be 100 grams. This is an assumption. It is wrong. It's an assumption, but it's helping us figure it out. From the percentage, we can then get the mass. Again, it's just assumed to be 100. So it's the same exact value as the percentages, 63.5, 8.2, and 28.3. Of course, the difference here is we're saying that these are grams. After this, you'll then calculate the number of moles of each element. So to do that, it is the given mass over the molar mass. So starting with silver, it is 60. Uh, it's really faint. Zoom in. Yeah, okay. It is 63.5 divided by the molar mass of silver, which according to the periodic table is 108. For nitrogen, it is 8.2 divided by the molar mass of nitrogen, which is 14. And then finally, in the case of oxygen, is 28.3 divided by the molar mass of oxygen, which is 16. Quickly calculate, I'll just do that myself in the interest of time. 63.5 divided by 108. We get 0 0.59. 8.2 divided by 14. We get 0 0.59 again. And then lastly, uh, 28.3 divided by 16, we get 1.76. All I've done was divide and calculate the moles. From here, we divide by the lowest number of moles. Of course, you should see that in this case, we have two of the exact same number, 0.59. Even if you uh, did different masses, you're more or less going to get 0 0.587 over here and 0 0.586. Like, Such a small difference that you ba they basically are identical. That's how we get the ratio. We divide all moles by the lowest number. 0 0.59 divided by 0 0.59, which we know to be 1. Over here, this is 0 0.59 divided by 0 0.59. Again, we know it to be 1. And then finally, 1.76 divided by 0 0.59. Put this in the calculator. 1.76 divided by 0 0.59. We get 2.98.
The ratio then allows us to determine the empirical formula. Again, the lowest whole number ratio. From left to right, we see that for every one silver, there is one nitrogen. For every one nitrogen, there are three oxygens. We round up because this is specifically greater than a 0.9 number. We are able to round up from 2.98 to three. If it were 2.87, you could not round that up. Again, the rule I've placed on you is that it must be 0.9 or higher. Some of you should recognize this pretty quickly as a compound. This is actually silver nitrate. However, depending on how you wrote your table, you might get something uh, in the order like, uh, like this. O3NAG, just depend on the order you wrote, right? These two are the same thing, right? So it doesn't matter the order which you write the elements because ultimately what I want to know is the whole number ratio. In other words, just because you did not get AGNO3 in that order does not mean you're wrong. Ultimately, all I care about is the ratio. Okay. Do we have any questions on this? No? Okay, great. Let's keep it going. I can just copy this back, fortunately. Yeah. I'm just going to quickly erase. All right, this question is asked, a gasoline additive is found to contain that amount of lead, that amount of carbon, that amount of hydrogen. Find its empirical formula. We know that the elements involved are lead, carbon, and hydrogen. From the question, we identify their percentages to be 64, 29.7, and finally 6.3. From there, we assume the mass to be 100 grams. This then allows us to immediately convert the percentages to grams. So it is the exact same number. Then we determine the number of moles of each element. Using the periodic table, in the case of lead, it is 64 divided by the molar mass, which is 207. For carbon, it is 29.7 divided by 12. And for hydrogen, 6.3 divided by 1. Again, I'll make it clear to calculate the number of moles. It is the mass above, quite literally, divided by the molar mass. Again, when I say mass above, I mean that quite literally. Doing the quick calculations on my uh, phone, 64 divided by 207. Lead is approximately 0 0.31. For carbon, 29.7 divided by 12. This is approximately 2.48. And then finding the case of hydrogen divided by one is itself 6.3. From there, we divide all of those moles by the lowest number which you should hopefully recognize to be 0.31. From left to right, we have 0.31 divided by 0.31. We can sort of immediately just write that as 1. 2.48 divided by 0 0.31. 6.3 divided by 0 0.31. Putting this in the calculator for the case of carbon, 2.48 divided by 0 0.31 is equal to eight, I've, I got a flat eight, 6.3 divided by 0. 0.31 is equal to 20.32. We now have our ratio of atoms. We can now put it all together and deduce that the empirical formula is in no particular order, PbC8H20. Recognize that 
we do not round up. Again, this is obvious in this particular case. You, know, you wouldn't round up in general. <clears throat> but as a reminder, it has to be 0.9 or above to round up. With this in mind, I would like for you all to attempt uh, part D on your own. Wait for me to do the molecular formula. So all I want you to do first is just determine the empirical formula of this compound, and then we'll do the molecular formula together. I will leave my uh, previous answer up so that you can quickly refer to it. It's 1040, take uh, five minutes. Get me the empirical formula. Again, just to make it clear, I want you to do part D. Two more minutes.
Okay, 1045. Does it get through this one? It's okay if you did not finish the question. I, I, it's completely fine if you did. From left to right, we know we're working with carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Using the given percentages, we write that carbon is 74, 8.7, and nitrogen is 7.3. Assuming the mass is 100, those percentages also become the masses. From there, we determine the number of moles of each atom. As you can see from the formula, it is the mass above divided by the molar mass. Carbon is 74 divided by 12. Hydrogen is 8.7 divided by 1. And then nitrogen is 17.3 divided by 14. Calculator then tells me 74 divided by 12 is 6.17. Of course, anything divided by one is the same thing. And then for nitrogen, 17.3 divided by 14 is approximately one, two, three. From here, we divide by the lowest number of moles, which we identified to be nitrogen. 6.17 divided by 1.23. 8.7 divided by 1.23 and 1.23 divided by 1.23. That one's the easiest one. We can immediately equate that to be one. In the case of hydrogen, 8.7 divided by 1.23 is approximately equal to 7.07. .07. And in the first case, 6.17 divided by 1.23 is equal to 5.02. Now we have the whole number ratio. None of them will be rounded, right? Rounded up. So we can deduce that the empirical formula is C5H7N. Again, the order of elements does not matter. If you wrote the nitrogen first, hydrogen first, that's fine. The point of this question is just whole number ratio. Okay. Now that we have the empirical formula, we can work on the second part together, which is asking us to determine the molecular formula. The molecular formula, MF, is equal to the mass of the, uh, the molar mass of the sample divided by the molar mass of the empirical formula. And that number will be used to multiply by the empirical formula. Okay. So the molar mass of the sample, I have given it to you in the question. It's 162.1. Uh, this should be grams per mole. I think, uh, I think when I was using the control F function, I accidentally deleted all the instances of mole. Uh, <clears throat> but this should be grams per mole. That is, of course, how you know it's the molar mass of the sample. Plugging and chugging now, therefore, we get the molar mass of the sample to be 162.1. We know that from the question. And then the molar mass of the empirical formula, we can actually calculate it very quickly. It's five carbons, seven hydrogens, and one nitrogen. This gives us 60 plus 7 plus 14. So 60 plus 21. This gives us approximately 81 grams per mole. This is the molar mass of the empirical formula. And we already know the empirical formula to be C5H7N. You do the division, you should get approximately two. Multiply that by the empirical formula C5H7N. Our final answer is C10H14N2. So this is the empirical formula, and this is the molecular formula. This is what the chemical actually is. This is just the simplest whole number ratio. Do you have any questions on this? Great. Uh, let's attempt another one.
Let us do G as in goat. I'm just gonna quick, I'm just gonna draw the tables. So if you also wanna kinda get your table set up, now's a good time to do that. All right, an organic acid is found to have a molar mass of yada yada. It is comprised of the following elements with the following percentages. Determine both its empirical and molecular formula. So we know the elements involved are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Their percentages are in order 40%, 6.7%, and 53.3%. Under the assumption that the mass is 100 grams, we then get the individual masses of each element. From there, we can calculate the number of moles, which is the number above divided by the molar mass of the atom, sorry, of the element. Putting this into my calculator, for carbon, 40 divided by 12 is 3.33. For hydrogen, any number divided by one is the same number. And for oxygen, 53.3 divided by 16 is also approximately 3.33. These numbers are really nice to look at. So we, pretty can, we can just look and see the, the ratio. Doesn't really take us much effort to see the ratio is one to two to one. I just did a little mental math. The lowest number is 3.3, .3, which occurs twice, so they're one. And then finally 6.7 divided by 3.33 .3 is approximately two. This then tells us that the empirical formula of the molecule is C2, I'm sorry, C one H two O. We do not write the one, it's not necessary. Since we know we're eventually going to calculate it, let's just go ahead and calculate the molar mass. Uh, this is one carbon plus two hydrogens plus one oxygen. This is 12 plus two plus 16. This is approximately 30 grams per mole. We're then asked to calculate the molecular formula, MF. The molecular formula is equal to the molar mass of the sample divided by the molar mass of the empirical formula. You multiply that number by the empirical formula. You can see that from the given question, the molar mass of the sample is 60.05. And we've previously calculated to the empirical formula to have a mass of 30. You can quickly see that this is approximately two times CH, 2O. Therefore, the final molecular formula is C2, H4, O2. Any questions on this? Okay. All right. Let's go back a couple pages. We covered enough of the empirical formula. I think we've done like four questions. That's pretty good. Uh, let's see if we can do a couple more of these uh, these math based questions over here. We have about like ten minutes left. Okay, so we're back with problem two. We're back on page three. Kind of recenter everybody. Uh, these are the three expressions. These are the three known expressions that we have that we're going to use in some way, shape, or form. Uh, let us do 
Well, these are all asking the same thing. So let's actually move on to another one. Let's do the first question on this next page, page four. How much moles and how much does it weigh? Okay. So <clears throat> we're being asked to compare moles and masses. You can turn your page back and see it, of course, but we do know that one mole of anything is equal to the molar mass of the compound. So the first thing to do is calculate the molar mass, which is one aluminum at its one phosphorus at its four oxygens. Using the periodic table, this is 26 plus 32 plus four times 16. 26 plus 32 is uh, 58 plus 64. This looks to be 122. Okay. The total mass is therefore 122 grams. That is our known expression. Because we know that one mole, we know how to calculate one mole. It is just the molar mass of the compound. Now we want to know, specifically in the case of 1.4 moles, how much does that weigh? We have our two by two cell on one unknown. We can then cross multiply. One times X is X. So the final answer can be gotten from X is equal to 122 times 1.4. Putting this in our calculator, 122 times 1.4, we get 170.8 grams. All right, let's keep it going with the next one. Uh, yeah. No, yeah, that's just practice for you because percent composition comes back in empirical formula. So it's more practice for you to understand. Yeah. Good question. Okay, moving on to the next one. Uh, we're looking at the second question, 2.2 .2 moles of that calcium compound. We can quickly calculate the molar mass of this. We know that it is a sum of one calcium, two chlorines, and six oxygens. Please note where these numbers are coming from. There is only one calcium, and there are two off this aisle. If each ion has one chlorine, then in total we have two. And if each ion has three oxygens, then in total we have six. We can quickly calculate this. Uh, from the periodic table, calcium is 40. Chlorine, you can approximate it to be 70 grams after times by two. And then for oxygen, uh, six times 16 is 96. Putting this all together, 40 plus 70 plus 96. <clears throat> we can therefore get that one mole of this compound is approximately equal to 206 grams. We specifically want to know how much does 2.2 .2 moles weigh. Cross multiplication is straightforward. It's just X is equal to 206 times 2.2. .2. Putting this into our calculator, we get approximately 453.2 grams. Okay. For that, let's skip down uh, another question or two. You skip the next question. We're specifically looking at how many molecules are in 240 grams of CO. All right, so now we're being asked to compare, I'm sorry, to relate molecules and mass. That's gonna be Avogadro's rule. Let me go over that once again. We're being asked molecules and mass. On the previous page, that's what we did, molecules and mass. So we're gonna use the same expression here. We know that there are 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules uh, of anything in one mole. So we need to know the molar mass of carbon oxide, carbon monoxide. This is only one of each element. This is just 12 times 12 plus 16 to give us 28. 
This therefore means that there are 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules in 28 grams of this. This is our known expression. What we don't know are how many molecules are in 240 grams. But we have our two by two, one unknown, we can cross multiply. We can eventually get that X is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23, multiplied by 240, all over 28. If someone could do that for me really quickly and just tell me the answer to two decimal places, that would be great. It's not always on the right side because notice I had put the molecules on the left. Yeah, I could have done it the other way. I could have said 28 is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23, in which case it would just be 240 on the bottom and X on the right. What's more important is that you keep the same units or the same sort of measurement on the same side. You can see on the left side, this is only molecules. On the right side, this is only grams. So that's what you wanna keep consistent. Does anyone have the answer to do decimal places? 5.16 times 10 to 24, that number does make sense. Uh, do we have any conflicting answers? Great, fantastic. Okay, I do not think we have enough time to go through another question of this type. Uh, so we're wrapping up for today. I'll just give a couple more thoughts leading into the exam. <clears throat> As a reminder, the extra credit is to complete the two worksheets during these problem solving sessions. They're already available. And of course you can feel free to consult the, the, the recording. I've already assured you that uh, questions related to reactions, they're gonna look exactly like this. Questions related to ionic equations, well, we just did a couple examples. Uh, and from the mole, you're going to get questions that look like problem two. You're going to get questions that look like problem four. So those three big problems are most closely resemble your exam. Those are the ones you should prepare for. As we wrap up for today, uh, just before I forget, today's lab, Thursday lab, we will start at 1120. So around a 15 minute break. For everyone else, uh, have a good spring break. I'll see you in next, you know, like week and a half for our exam. And of course, if you'd like to send me your attempts to kind of check your work, I'm more than happy to check it. Just email me. With that, have a good day. Have a good weekend. Have a good break. For the Thursday lab, I'll see you in like 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, is, there, is it an experiment or it's a worksheet? So a worksheet is ultimately fine. But it's just a document. Um, I do think that particular lab is good to have some practice. So I would prefer to become on the other section. So the really? funeral, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that way you would still get some like media so practice. I can still like do it in turn. Yeah. Okay. You just come to the Thursday lab because okay. I'm assuming you only need to go out for one day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Is there a question? Yeah. Uh, the Tuesday.